Good afternoon. My name is Kent Mormon, and I am the chair of the Transportation Advisory Committee, known as Dr. Cog TAC. I call to order the August 23rd, 2021 Dr. Cog TAC meeting. Dr. Cog uses a digital platform, Zoom. Members and alternates, you, will, you have the ability to mute and unmute yourselves and share your webcam. With this new platform, even though we are now able to use cameras, we still ask that you use the raise hand button to indicate you have a question or would like to speak for an agenda item um, or on questions or comments. Please make sure that you've typed, you, your type name reflects your first and last name and your representation. If you have any technical questions, you can direct those to staff in the Q&A box. Again, please use the raise hand feature to ask any questions uh, related to the agenda items. At this time, uh, Cam, will you please list all attendees? If for some reason you do not hear your name, please um, um, email Cam um, Kennedy at drcog.org. Cam, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, in attendance for alternates and members, I currently see Kent Mormon, Aaron Bustow, Carol Buchanan, Chris Chauvin, Chris Hudson, Deborah Basket, Elizabeth Relford, Eugene Howard, Jan Rowe, Jeff Dackenbring, Justin Bagley, Kristen Kenyon, Mac Callison, Maria DeAndre, Mike Silverstein, Phil Greenwald, Richard Pilgrim, Rob Zuccaro, Ron Papsdorf, Sarah Grant, Steve Durian, Thomas Reif. And those are the, uh, the members and alternates I see at this moment, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ken. Again, um, if you did not uh, hear your name, please email Cam at ckennedy at drcock.org. Um, at this time, I'd like to inter ha have Jacob Rigger introduce uh, some of our new uh, TAC members and some of the changes uh, on the committee. Uh, Jacob, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, a couple of things we wanted to talk about at the beginning of the meeting. Um, as the chair alluded to, we have a new member and a new alternate that we want to welcome today. Um, our new member is uh, Frank Gray <clears throat> from the Castle Rock EDC. He's the CEO. He is our new member filling the uh, business and economic development special interest seat. Uh, so on behalf of the chair, welcome to Frank if you're here today. And then we have a new alternate, um, a temporary alternate from the city of Louisville. Um, and that is Rob Zaccaro, who is temporarily stepping in for Megan Davis um, as a new alternate. So Rob, welcome to you as well. Um, and then also we wanted to take care of this at the beginning of the meeting while we have uh, robust attendance. You'll notice on the agenda that for the September meeting, uh, we had indicated rescheduling the September 27th meeting to October 4th. Um, the reason for that is because we're in the middle of our 30 day public comment period for complete streets toolkit or draft complete streets toolkit document. Um, and we wanna make sure that we have enough time to uh, conclude that public comment and stakeholder period, uh, revise the document, respond to comments received. Um, and we actually need to bring it to you for action at your next meeting uh, to stay on track for October board action on the final complete streets toolkit. So we had contemplated moving the September 27th TAC meeting to October 4th. Um, we were informed by CDOT that October 4th is actually a state holiday. So we'd actually like to do a quick Mentimeter poll uh, to poll members and alternates of TAC um, on a couple alternate uh, dates for the next late September, maybe early October TAC meeting. Uh, so thank you, Emily. You should see on your screen um, the uh, address for the menti.com. So menti.com. Uh, once you're there, you will enter the number that you see, 9165. 6896, um, or you can use the QR code uh, to get there. So we'll give folks a sec to be able to do that. And then it's just a one question uh, poll for meeting dates. Hey, Jacob, this is Phil Greenwald. I don't see a, oh, there they are. 
Never mind. Yep. Yep, so here are the four dates that we'd like to pull you on for um, alternate meeting date. Friday, October 1st. Um, again, we had originally contemplated Monday, October 4th. That is a state holiday. Um, so maybe Tuesday, October 5th or Wednesday, October 6th. Um, and again, the, it looks like folks are voting, but again, if you need the code, it's 9165-6896. So we'll give folks a second to do this. All right, let's give this a few more seconds, but it looks like either Tuesday the 5th or Wednesday the 6th. Again, members and alternates, um, please vote if you haven't already. All right, it's looking like Wednesday the 6th, probably at the same time, or 1.30 that we're used to having TAC meetings. Um, not, a, not a dramatic winner, but uh, sort of a majority of responses for Wednesday, October 6th. Um, does, can that work for most folks? Um, raise your hand if you'd like to make a comment on that. We'll call, call on you. Jacob, I'm not seeing any hands raised, so okay. I wanted, uh, Wednesday, October 6th. Okay. We're going to tentatively say uh, Wednesday, October 6th, that afternoon. Um, if for some reason someone has a strong objection or an issue, please uh, contact me offline. But uh, for now, we'll, we'll go forward with that, and we appreciate folks' flexibility. All right, Mr. Chair, that's all I had, so I will turn it back to you. Thank you. Thank you. At this at um, this time, I'd also like to welcome Rob and Frank. Um, at this time, we'll uh, open the meeting for public comment. If you have joined by computer, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand, and we will call on you to begin speaking. If you have joined the phone by phone, please raise your virtual hand by pressing star nine and we will call on you by the last three digits of your phone number. Staff will unmute you, and then you will need to unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone. You will have three minutes to speak, after which we will ask you to wrap up your comments and your line will be muted. As a reminder to everybody, um, once the public comment period is completed, only TAC members and alternates will participate in the discussion regarding the uh, each agenda item. So with that, um, uh, please raise your hand um, if you have uh, would like to participate in public comment. I am not seeing any hands raised. Cam, are you? Uh, no, I am not, Mr. Chair. Okay then we will um, move on um, to our next, next agenda item, which is our action items. Um, or excuse me, it's our TAC summary meeting from July 26th. Uh, are there any discussions, corrections, or questions about the July 26th, 2021 uh, TAC meeting summary? If so, please raise your hand and uh, We'll we'll uh, take your let allow you to speak, uh, TAC members and alternates. I am not seeing any hands raised, so they will uh, stand approved as as submitted. We will now enter now uh, move on to our action items, and our first action item is um, the fiscal year 2022-2025 uh, transportation improvement program uh, amendments. And I believe Todd uh, Cottrell is making this uh, uh, presentation. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so good, uh, good afternoon, almost a good evening. Uh, good afternoon, uh, TAC members, alternates, and everyone else. Um, this afternoon, we have six amendments to the 22-25 um, tip for your consideration. So the first is the CDOT Region 1 uh, design pool. 
Um, this is technically a new project for this tip, but we are actually carrying this forward from an old seven through 12 tip. Um, this region one design pool um, is used to begin the design uh, process on any number of CDOT funded projects. Um, so the amendment is to um, carry this forward to the new tip with six dual pool projects for a total of ten and a half million dollars. Uh, the second is a new project uh, sponsored by CDOT Region 4 for Mobility Hub Pool. Um, and this project would add four, I'm sorry, would add one new mobility hub um, for a total cost of $13 million. And that is the Longmont uh, Firestone Mobility Hub. Um, the third project is, a, is also a new project uh, by CDOT Region 4. And it is uh, the State Highway 7 and 95th uh, street or otherwise known as State Highway 7 intersection improvements. Um, this is a total cost for um, $6.9 million. The fourth um, proposal for you this afternoon is CDOT Region 4 non-regionally significant RPP pool. And this is actually tied back to um, the intersection project we just discussed. Um, so the amendment here is just to place the State, State Highway 7 and 95th Avenue intersection improvement into the RPP pool, um, even though it will show uh, no funding at all. Um, this is just to be able to keep um, the tip sort of uh, better organized. Uh, the next amendment is the CDOT Region 1 um, I-70 noise walls. Um, and this is to add phases three, three through six um, using $20 million of state legislative funds. And the final amendment for your consideration this afternoon is the Region 1 Mobility Hub, um, where this amendment would add two new pool projects, uh, increase the cost on two existing pool projects, and then also add $19.3 million into the pool using um, state legislative transit funds. So those are the amendments for your uh, consideration this afternoon. Um, be happy to take any comments or questions that you may have. Um, otherwise, we'd be looking for a motion to uh, recommend to the Regional Transportation Committee. Are there uh, any uh, questions? Uh, please raise your hand. Uh, Sarah Grant, go ahead. I move to recommend to the Regional Transportation Committee the attached amendments to the 2022 to 2025 Transportation Improvement Program. It's been moved. Is there a second, Deborah? See your hand. I will raised. second that motion. Thank you. Thank you. Do either of you wish to speak to this? Nope. Okay, so it's been moved and seconded. Uh, are there additional, uh, is there additional discussion? I see no hands raised. So with that, uh, except for Deborah's, I think she's just- Oh, talking. sorry, I'll put it down. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, it's been moved and seconded. Um, please unmute your mics. And uh, um, if you're uh, in agreement, say aye. 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 If you're opposed, say no. And are there any abstentions? Motion passed unanimously. We'll move on to our next uh, action item. And again, Todd uh, Cottrell will be uh, presenting this. It's the fiscal year 2022-2025 Transportation Improvement Program Supplemental Waitlist Call for Projects. Todd? Uh, thank you again, Mr. Chair. There we go. Um, so if you recall, um, this past April, um, the board took action to program additional COVID funds and on top of additional fu uh, regular funds that Dr. Cog had to program. And as part of that action, um, because many of our waiting lists were depleted after going through those COVID decisions, um, the board also took action to issue a new supplemental wait list call um, in order to beef some of these wait lists back up. Um, even though there was no new funding that, that was available and currently is still not available. Um, so as part of that decision, any of those projects that were selected as part of this waitlist call, um, they would be placed on the existing waitlists after uh, 
the existing waitlist projects on each one of those individual lists. So in late April, uh, Dr. Cox staff opened up the supplemental waitlist call um, and concluded it on June 21st. Uh, a total of eight eligible applications were received and are summarized on the table on the, on the screen that you can see. So three regional applications totaling $7.4 million. Um, one was submitted for the Adams subregion for 200,000. Um, three applications submitted for the Jefferson County subregion um, for 4.26 million. And finally one eligible application for the Southwest Weld um, subregion totaling $1.6 million. As part of this call, um, Dr. Cog also placed sort of funding targets upon each of the eligible um, wait lists. Um, there were some wait lists that were depleted more than others. Some did retain um, enough projects that if we did receive additional funding, there, there would be the opportunity for those subregions to actually select projects off those lists. Um, however, um, we went in with a funding target for each eligible subregion that equaled approximately um, one year's worth of funding. Um, so, for example, on the regional sub on the regional uh, wait list, uh, because there was no more projects after um, the COVID funding was programmed, uh, the funding target was set at at fifteen million dollars. And of course, for the three eligible subregions, you can see. Um, those funding targets on that far right hand side. Um, the ineligible, uh, ineligible subregions that were not allowed to submit during this call had enough projects on their lists and therefore did not need to beef them up at that time. So Dr. Cog's staff um, took these eligible applications and scored them among six Dr. Cog staff. Uh, we turned the those, uh, those scores over to a project review panel that met in the middle of July to recommend those projects to be added to the wait list. Um, so the panel met and discussed and then made a, a final recommendation to fund all of these projects or all of these projects should be added to the individual wait list in score order. Uh, so the panel recommendation is as follows and are highlighted in yellow. Um, so you can see the Lone Tree, Boulder County and Castle Pine applications um, to be placed and recommended to be placed on the regional share waiting list. Um, there's one project uh, study by Thornton to be added to the Adams County Forum. Uh, three projects highlighted in yellow again for the Jefferson County wait list by Evergreen, Parks and Rec, Golden and Lakewood. And finally, one project added from the town of Meade for the Southwest Weld County Forum. So that concludes sort of the information that we had uh, this afternoon um, and running through the, the recommended uh, action from the panel. Um, and so staff's recommendation to you is to move to recommend to the Regional Transportation Committee the supplemental projects in rank order to be added to the 22-25 TIP waitlist. Thank you, Todd. Are there any questions for Todd? Please raise your hand. I see that Brian has, uh, Weimer has, uh, Raised his hand. Go ahead, Brian. Um, yes, I'd like to move to recommend to the Regional Transportation Committee the supplemental projects in ranked order as shown today to be added to the 2022 to 2025 TIP waiting list. Thank you, Brian. Is there a um, second? Steve? Uh, yes, I second that motion. It's been moved and seconded. Um, is there any discussion? Please raise your hand. I see no hands raised, so we'll go ahead and move on to vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. Any abstentions? <coughs> Motion passed unanimously. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. Thank we'll you. We'll now move, move on to uh, our uh, project funding recommendation for the fiscal year 2022-23 Community Mobility Planning and Implementation tip aside. And uh, Brad Calvert will uh, lead this discussion. Go ahead, Brad. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as the chair noted, uh, as well as uh, in the meeting materials, this is an, is an action item. And I appreciate uh, the chair spelling out community mobility planning and implementation uh, studies and projects within this set aside. So you will most likely hear me refer to uh, them as CMPI. Um, over the last few cycles for this set aside, Derek Webb, a planner on the regional planning and development team, has been the primary staff contact uh, for this. But, but Derek, Derek uh, recently moved on uh, to some other opportunities. So I am pinch hitting on behalf of all the Dr. Cog staff that have uh, worked on this to get, uh, get to where we are today in terms of the recommendation that's in front of you. Um, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation, so I will be relying on the memo and, and the attachment for this item to provide background information. Uh, you can see uh, the, the overall recommendation uh, from the recommendation panel on the screen. That's within the body um, of the memo. Um, as noted uh, in the memo with the original investment from the TIP in this uh, two-year portion of the set-aside, uh, combined with uh, funds from a, the previous two-year cycle, we were standing at close to just shy of uh, $3 million that was available for planning studies and small infrastructure projects uh, through this uh, set-aside. Uh, as a reminder, uh, the CMPI set-aside actually uses a two-stage uh, application process. Uh, first phase involves uh, a letter of intent and consultation process with Dr. Cog's staff, uh, and then final uh, applications are submitted during the second part of that process. And as noted in the memo, uh, we received a total of 20 uh, applications, 14 uh, for planning studies and six for small infrastructure uh, projects. Uh, also noted in the memo, applications were evaluated by Dr. Cog's regional planning and development team, uh, as well as transportation planning and operations staff. Uh, additional, additionally, several CDOT staff served as resources to Dr. Cog's uh, project evaluation panel. Um, as, as, as shown on screen, uh, you can see uh, review panel recommendations. Um, they're the table that are that's on screen now, but also within the body uh, of the memo. Um, you'll note that uh, this table um, sort of notes that both distinct project categories within the set aside, both the planning side and the small infrastructure funds uh, actually had uh, funds remaining um, after the initial recommendation from the evaluation panel. So as sort of laid out uh, in the memo, Dr. Cog's staff is making uh, some further recommendations uh, that are part of the motion today. Um, that is that the remaining funds in both categories be combined. Uh, and that those pooled funds that remain uh, be awarded to the city of Thornton uh, transit study. Uh, the application with the next highest score from the evaluation panel. Um, ex we expended all the funds on the small infrastructure uh, side of uh, the set aside, so only planning studies uh, remained. Uh, you may notice uh, in the attachment that the City of Thornton application actually had the exact same score as the Town of Superior application. Um, the Town of Superior application was considered uh, the higher scoring application because their lower amount of federal uh, funding uh, requested could be accommodated uh, with the portion of the set aside directed to planning studies. Um, but once we ultimately pool those funds um, as recommended by staff, uh, that allows uh, the uh, city of Thornton study to be funded uh, as well. Uh, what you see on screen is attachment one. Um, it notes uh, all applications submitted uh, as well as final recommended studies and projects that are included in the proposed motion, uh, in this case highlighted in green uh, on the screen as well as uh, in the table. And just one quick note, um, all projects recommended for uh, funding awards are receiving the full amount of federal funds uh, requested uh, in their application. Uh, so that's the summary I wanted to provide. Chair, happy to answer any questions the group might have. Thank you, Brad. Uh, are there any questions for Brad? I see that uh, Art Griffith has his hand raised. Well, I would move to recommend to RTC the let me try it, CPMI project selection list. <clears throat> a uh, longer, you. longer, longer statement I concur with. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Deborah. I see your hand raised. Was yes. that a second? I, I actually, my camera so you can see me. Um, I actually was just gonna comment before the motion even that I'm really pleased with the list. Um, Hope that it's geographically diverse. I would love that Westie is getting money. Um, but I really think this is indicative of local jurisdictions understanding that the pieces and parts of mobility are valuable to the system. So I was I'm a little bit Pollyanna, but I'm hoping we're getting to a regional system by these small planning projects and small infrastructure projects. I will second the motion. Thank you, Deborah. Um, Brian, I see you have your hand raised. 
any discussion? Yes, and, and I have a question, and that is, you know, I, and I'll be a little bit parochial. I'll see that, you know, City of Inglewood has a 83.4 score and Thornton Superior had 83.6. How are we really distinguishing 0.2 hundredths or two tenths of a percent relative to these these scores? It, and is that meaningful? So Brad, you can take that one. She likes to sit on my So um, any, any question that asks whether right of the decimal point is meaningful, uh, you've already put me at a disadvantage, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, I think that maybe the main thing to note is that we had, I want to say seven or eight uh, folks uh, review the applications and, and looked at it all sorts of different ways, dropping the highest and lowest scores, uh, averaging across um, and even sort of every way that we sliced and diced it, even with this very narrow margin, we, we always sort of came back to the same uh, rank order. Um, so again, I don't know if that gets to meaningfulness right at the decimal point, uh, but at least uh, we, we, we kicked the tires a lot uh, related to the independent scores uh, that came in. And when, when ultimately they shook out, uh, we were still at this point in terms of rank order. Ryan, that answer your question. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Sarah uh, Grant with City and County Broomfield, you had a question? Yes, I did, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I was looking at the, the dollar amounts requested for the City Arvada Little Dry Creek Trail grade separation and the Town of Superior McCaslin underpass feasibility study. It appears it's the exact same amount. I just want to be sure that's accurate. Sarah, I don't want to answer you on the fly, so we will definitely go back and check and make sure that when RTC uh, sees this, that we have uh, the right amount. If you give me a minute or two, I can probably uh, dig into that, but I, I don't want to hold this up. Um, I'll see where that. Okay, great. I just wanted to call to your attention in attachment one, those two projects are shown as the same dollar amount. So just wanted to be sure we're checking that. Thank you for on that, Sarah. Any other questions or comments? Not seeing any, we'll go ahead and move, go vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, signify by saying no. And any abstentions? I do not hear any abstentions. Uh, motion passes unanimously. We'll move on to our next action item, which is the updated uh, non discrimination plans. And Alvin Bedell Sanchez will be uh, presenting this item, I believe. So, Alvin Bedell, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. I will also be having Emily share her screen for this presentation just for some technical issues. So uh, I have the follow-up to our informational briefing that came out on last month that I presented before y'all. Um, I wanna make sure y'all can see the presentation on your end. I'm resharing because it didn't, it looked like it paused. One sec. Not yet. Thank you. There, there it is, Alvin. Great, thank you so much. So this is our action item for our three non-discrimination plans, the Title VI Implementation Plan, our Limited English Proficiency Plan, and the Americans with Disabilities Act Program Access Plan. Next. Our Title VI Implementation Plan demonstrates that Dr. Cog has the resources available to provide all of our services in a non-discriminatory manner. It also documents any related activities that we've done over the last three years. So that includes major plans or programs that have been adopted and how staff took non-discrimination into consideration. And it's also a way to inform the public and our recipients of the standard process that we have for reviewing all of our different programs, projects, and even the recipients to make sure they are also in compliance with Title VI. Next. It's our most expansive plan. Uh, two key parts include a demographic profile of the Denver region. So that looks at the seven vulnerable populations that were used in the 2050 RTP and maps those out. So you can see the concentrations across the region. It also includes a transportation investment analysis. So you can see how the near-term investments from our 2022 to 2025 TIP 
uh, compare to the different concentrations of vulnerable populations. It also outlines our policies and procedures that Dr. Cog has in place. So that includes our complaint procedures, our policy statement, our meeting accommodation language that we include. A new piece is subrecipient monitoring. Now that we're the designated recipient for FTA's 5310 funding, we have to monitor the grantees that receive federal funding. So making sure they are also in compliance with Title VI. It outlines the data that's available to local governments as well as staff and how it's used to make decisions for investment, uh, targeting of outreach, to make sure we're including all vulnerable populations in our planning process. And then it also provides a summary of the major public participation elements over the last three years. Our second plan is the Limited English Proficiency Plan. The goal of this plan is to make sure all residents in the region can participate in Dr. Cog's activities to the fullest extent practicable. So to do that, it identifies individuals in the region who may need language assistance. Uh, identifies what language assistance is available and how we let folk in the region know that there is assistance available. It also notes any training that's required of staff to make sure they're aware of all the different resources that are available to them to assist uh, an individual who might need assistance in a language other than English. The LEP plan is centered around a four factor analysis that staff uses to determine what are reasonable steps to have in place. Uh, the first factor is the number or proportion of LAP persons in the region. So for the Dr. Cog region, there are about 8% of the population that is five years old or older are considered individuals with limited English proficiency or they speak English less than very well. Factor two is the frequency with which LEP individuals come in contact with our program. That varies on our different divisions. Uh, our Way to Go program has on average received about 22 requests in a language other than English, English for assistance while our Area Agency on Aging receives about 6,700 requests each year for assistance in a language other than English. Factor three is the nature and importance of the program. So we use federal funds for short range and long range planning as this group knows, as well as for uh, providing uh, contracts for agencies that deliver meals to congregate dining facilities, as well as homes. And then the last factor, is the resources that are available to Dr. Cog and the cost to Dr. Cog. So while we don't translate every major plan or program we do, we are proactive in education, promotion and engagement in, in each of those major plans and programs. And we also make sure there are resources available to staff online, over the phone and in our physical office, just so you can, just so staff are also available to help in case an individual comes in who needs language assistance. And then the last plan is our Americans with Disabilities Act program access plan. It outlines Dr. Cog's requirements under the ADA, and it documents how we are making sure all of our different programs, activities, and services are accessible to individuals with disabilities. That includes making sure any alterations to our office space are ADA compliant. Uh, we include features on our website that allow folk to uh, change the text size, as well as the contrast, making it safe for individuals who experience seizures. We also discuss how our public meetings are accessible for our meeting accommodation language, what, uh, what we can provide for a member of the public who asks for assistance to attend a meeting. We also discuss how our planning process is inclusive of individuals with disabilities. So that can include uh, using data to target outreach, making sure that the needs of vulnerable populations are included in our, in our decision-making. And then just as our Title VI plan has a new piece in, in it, our ADA program access plan does as well. And that's subrecipient monitoring so making sure our grantees are also in compliance with the ADA and not just Title VI. The three plans were available for public review for a month. Uh, they were promoted through our website, social media, and an e-blast. There were two rounds of social media posts, one at the beginning to introduce the plans and one at the last week for a final reminder to get any comments, comments to us. These were also shared with staff at CDOT, RTD, Federal Highway, and FTA to get any specific comments from those three regional agencies. And the three plans before you have uh, had those comments addressed. So we're before y'all for a recommendation to the RTC and then we'll be going before the RTC and the board in September. That still gives us a couple of weeks to button down the plans and get them submitted by the federal deadline of October 1st. So our proposed motion is to recommend to the RTC adoption of the Title VI Implementation Plan and the associated Limited English Proficiency Plan and American with Disabilities Act Program Access Plan. I'm happy to take any questions, Chair. Thank you. Are there any uh, questions? Um, I see Jacob, you have your hand raised. Go ahead, Jacob. 
Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't want to preempt questions, but I did just want to thank Alvin for managing this work uh, and for the staff team that put this together. Um, all of these plans are federal requirements and they're certainly very important in that context, but it's really more than that. Um, as Alvin talked about in this presentation, it really speaks to how we conduct our work um, at Dr. Cog and how we make that work accessible. Um, and I appreciate the care and thoughtfulness that the staff team put into um, updating and revising these plans. So I just wanted to recognize staff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jacob. Um, not seeing any other hands raised, I do entertain a motion. Please raise your hand. Brian, please go ahead. Mr. Chair, uh, I'd move to recommend to the Regional Transportation Committee adoption of the Title VI Implementation Plan and the Associated Limited English Proficiency Plan and Americans with Disabilities Act Program Access Plan. Thank you, Brian. Um, I see uh, Frank has his, his hand raised. Go ahead, Frank. Yeah, I was just gonna second that motion. Second, so it's been moved and seconded. Is there any additional discussion? Please raise your hand. Not seeing any additional hands raised, uh, we'll uh, don't move. Go ahead and vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, no. Any abstentions? Motion passed unanimously. Thank you, Alvin. We'll now move on to our informational briefings. And our first one will be by Todd Cottrell on the fiscal year 2024-2027 TIP policy elements. Um, and that continuing our discussion as we, we develop the, the policy. Go ahead, um, Todd. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so believe it or not, this is our fifth consecutive month um, in talking about potential changes and our staff recommendations towards the TIP policy covering 24 through 27. Um, so this afternoon, we bring back three topics from last month, um, including how to handle uh, canceled projects, uh, minimum project size, and sub-regional funding split formula. Uh, then we'll also introduce two new topics. Um, uh, tip set asides, and then finally take a turn into the tip application um, and how to possibly incorporate um, Dr. Cog and our partner agency plans and potential uh, changes to the focus areas. So um, we are using menti.com again. Um, and again, this is very similar to what we did at the top of um, uh, the top of top of this meeting. Um, so note that this is a new code that you'll be entering. Um, so you'll have to sort of exit out of the old um, and get right in. Uh, again, menti.com with the code of 7200-7558, or you can scan the QR code if, uh, if you are more tech, tech savvy than everyone else. Uh, but anyhow, this will get us into sort of some of the questions that we'll be turning and asking you and looking for your recommendation um, here this afternoon. So I believe the code should remain at the top of your screen uh, once we move off of um, this title slide. So the first um, topic that we're going to dive into is the canceled projects. And again, we'll continue this conversation from last month. Um, so just to make everyone aware of what our current policy is, um, that if a sponsor happens to cancel a project, um, those funds are returned to where the funding originated from. So whether it's the regional share, the sub-regional share, or for the individual forum, or it happens to be from a set aside. Um, at the last, last month's discussion, um, the staff recommendation was that if a sponsor does cancel a project, um, that funding would get redistributed to other waiting lists and not where it was originally programmed. The exception to that recommendation would be that if that sponsor was able to find and come up with a new non-Dr. Cog funding source, so perhaps from CDOT, RTD, or maybe another uh, federal, state, or local source, um, this would not be the case. That funding would still go back to that forum. 
Um, so some of the comments that we heard at that time is uh, the members felt that it was too harsh and truly unreasonably harmed the entire forum instead of just the sponsor who happened to cancel that project. So this afternoon, we bring back three options for your consideration. Um, the first, uh, so option A, is that canceled project funding is returned to where it was originally programmed. Um, however, the sponsor would not be eligible to accept any waitlist funding in that tip cycle, of course, except if a new non-Dr. Cog funding source happened to be uh, used and found instead. So keeping in mind, again, this is setting a policy for the 24 to 27 tip cycle. So if a project sponsor cancels a project within that time frame, they would not be able to go after waitlist funding until uh, fiscal year 28. So essentially the, the tip after that. Um, however, staff uh, did have a question and was looking for your feedback uh, of how to handle both Denver and Broomfield since they are both a city and a county and 99.5% of the projects that would end up on um, in those forums would actually be Denver or Broomfield sponsored. The next option, uh, option B, that in the next tip, type, tip cycle, so again, remember we're talking about the 24 to 27 cycle. So this happens to be in the 28 to 31 cycle or if there happens to be any supplemental calls before that, any new applications that are submitted from that canceled project would automatically receive a half point reduction. And we recommend the half point reduction with the assumption that we were going to continue with um, the five point scale uh, as we talked about uh, in one of the last two months. Um, again, the same exception would hold true that if a new funding source is found, um, this would not be the case. Um, there's also the question that we bring forth of, again, how do we handle both Denver and Broomfield being both a city and county and having their project solely on the list? Um, again, the, uh, a third option is going to be um, no policy changes. Um, and then now we can directly move into uh, Mentimeter to sort of get you what your thoughts are. Um, and then we'll have the opportunity, depending on those answers, how they display out. Um, if we would like to continue and sort of have a discussion on how to handle both Denver and Broomfield. Um, so again, the, the Mentimeter code should be at the top of your screen. Um, and the question we pose to you is the tip policy changes for the canceled project sponsors. Um, again, option A, um, no, wait, no wait list project until FY28. Option B is any future applications, so 28 to 31 cycle. Um, that sponsor receive a half point reduction and C, no change, which simply means that the, um, the funding will return back to where, where it originally came from. All right, just uh, another 10, 15 seconds here. Todd, once the polls closed, I see we have a couple of members that have comments. Okay. All right, so approximately 70, 30 splits and saying no changes to the canceled policy um, and Oh, yep. Let's leave it right there and uh, answer questions. Um, Brian, go ahead. So Tell my question, question is, and maybe you can remind me um, over the last couple of tip cycles, how many canceled projects have you dealt with? I would say five to seven would be my best guess without looking. And generally, what was that because of? Um, for sure is usually priority changes. Maybe it's a change of council. Um, another way to look at it is, 
um, that project maybe was uh, happened to be done with some other funding sources and didn't need to be federalized. Um, another uh, typical one is that um, they had a, a, a better chance to really look at that uh, scope of work and refine it where um, they would have to bring additional funding to the table and did not have that at this time. So it was easier just to um, return the federal funds. Uh, another one would happen to be it involves project delays where perhaps they were up against a deadline to receive either a first or second um, year delay. And uh, it was easier just to return the funds rather to, than to go through that process. So really just a single digit percentage given overall the number of projects that you're funding. Correct, there, there's not a lot. I mean, I would say on average over the last five or six cycles, it, it is usually in that you know four to six range. It's not a high percentage. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Art, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, I guess um, for me, I I can't wrap my hands around how we would handle Denver and Broomfield. So I I, I think we really need to know how that would be handled because um, you know if if they got a pants uh, project canceled, the money just stays with those agencies and. And then the other ones wouldn't have that. So that, that seemed really hard to, to figure out um, how to move forward without knowing what the Broomfield Denver solution is so that they don't get the get out of jail free card like in Monopoly. That's it. Thanks, sir. Justin? Go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Justin Begley, uh, City of Denver. I, I just want to clear something up. Um, I don't want it to be mischaracterized that uh, only Denver projects get funded in our subregion. Um, we did have multiple applicants that weren't Denver, um, and nearly half of our subregional funds went to uh, any other than Denver. So, um, let you know. We will, I expect, in our next cycle, have more applicants as the process enters its second cycle. So just want to be sure we understand that just because Denver has its own sub-regional forum doesn't mean it keeps and contains all its own. Thank you for the clarification, Justin. Are there any others that would like to discuss this? I do not see any hands raised, so Todd, I'll let you continue. All right, thank you so much. So we can move on to the second topic, uh, which is minimum project size, again, continued from last month. Um, so if you recall, um, there was a pre-existing um, recommendation where the sub-regional share minimum would be $100,000 uh, request in Dr. Cog funds. And for the regional share, um, that would be $5 million with the exception of studies. And TAC members at that meeting discussed and asked that we bring back a poll um, to see if that $5 million minimum um, was the correct number. Um, so things have changed slightly since our last discussion. Um, staff brought this topic to the board this last Wednesday. And overwhelmingly, the board felt that um, $5 million might not be the right number. Um, and I think mainly it has to do with it uh, you know, unfairly penalized um, those smaller communities who might not be able to put forth that size match that would be required. Um, I can't really sit back here and give you an exact poll number based on the information because the question that we asked um, was not worded correctly, and I'll, I'll take the blame for that. Um, it was a loaded question. Um, so just again, based on the discussions and the comments that we heard, um, they were more leaning towards um, a, a minimum for the regional share might not be the correct way to go. Um, so 
we will turn to some polls here. Um, and so in your memo, um, you will see um, a regional share allocation of two, three, four, and five million. And then based on the board feedback this last Wednesday, um, staff added in the far left question was, um, let's keep it at a $100,000 minimum for the regional share, which would be the exact same as the sub-regional share. All right, let's give another 10 or 15 seconds here. So it looks like overwhelmingly um, uh, the feedback that Dr. Cogstaff is hearing is that it the minimum should be at $2 million. So now that we have that information, should pre-construction only funding requests have a different Dr. Cog allocated minimum. Um, so a yes answer would be different than 2 million. Um, a no vote would mean pre-construction should not be treated any differently. Another 10 seconds. All right, so overwhelmingly uh, about 80-20 split where pre-construction um, funding requests should have a different Dr. Cog minimum. So given in the previous poll that the funding request at least um, the opinion that we're getting here today should be approximately $2 million. Um, what should the minimum regional share uh, request be for pre-construction projects? Again, except for studies. Um, so 500,000, a million, 2 million, or the far right says half of the full project min minimum, which in this instance should be one, it will equal $1 million. Or I guess the, or there's another way to say this um, because again, $2 million might not be the final amount that ends up in the TIP uh, policy, um, but it would be half of whatever the full construction projects would be. All right, another 10 seconds. All right, well, thank you everyone for your feedback on this. Um, we'll take all of this into consideration, uh, especially when we bring a draft tip policy back to you here in a couple months. Todd, I, I had my hand up. Oh. Um, Sorry about that, Kent. I know no. you're trying to watch a lot of things. Sorry. Yep. Um, so no backsies on this study, but I I did want to say um, I watched the Dr. Cog board meeting, and paid particular question to this question as I think the board was unclear, uh, and Todd, you you um, alluded to this in how the question was phrased for the board. My takeaway was the board members were some confused about the regional share and the sub-regional share, and that I, I think they were kind of going to ground to protect the sub-regional share, thinking that this discussion was somehow going to 
uh, take away from that. And I think we're talking about different criteria for um, the minimum size of these projects. So I, my, my point is that I know that the subregional share is totally important to all of the staff and elected officials, no question about that. I, I was trying to think that what these questions were trying to get at was, is it really a large enough project to be regional, even if it's pre-construction? So somebody, um, could somebody speak to that of what the intention is around this? Thank you. Well, this goes back to the question that was asked last month. And I, I, I'm sorry, I don't recall who brought that up. Um, but again, it was just to, to put it out there to see if a pre-construction project uh, should be weighted differently in terms of the funding request than a, a normal typical construction project, again, ex excluding studies. And I'm sorry, my, my comments are, are applied to the previous question about- Oh, I'm the, sorry. No, I'm sorry, I didn't clarify that. Um, I have no issue with this pre-construction conversation. So, so really and actually about, I don't have an issue. I just wanted to make sure we are all on the same page with our elected officials to be clear about what this question is asking. The feedback that I gathered from them, and, and again, we did not expect the type of comments that we received. Um, so I think from our perspective, they felt $5 million was uh, very hard and unachievable if you're a smaller community and was really working to fight against that. Mm -hmm. Now, there was no indication whether there should be no minimum at all or whether that minimum just should be lowered in this instance, sort of to what you're saying at $2 million. So I, I think what we will do is certainly go back and maybe re-listen to that board meeting and then take in, you know, take everything into consideration um, and present a draft here in a couple of months within the policy. Okay, it's just, it's such an important question. I felt like the board was losing sight of how we got to where we were. And I, I my, um, my observation has been that the sub-regional share and the countywide decision-making has made decisions to lift up small communities. And I'm, I don't represent a small community, but that was what I thought I heard from this last tip process. So I, I, I just wanna make sure our board members are clear on what, what the question is. Right, them. yep. Thank you, Deborah. Mm -hmm. Ron, uh, you had your hand up. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Just to just to close the loop on this conversation, because the board the board conversation last Wednesday was was pretty interesting, and I and I think um, we all have had conversations around this table at TAC about the challenge of sort of create developing a definition of a regional project for the regional share um, kind of decision making, and so we we sort of settled on project cost as a proxy. And I think it's fair criticism to consider the fact that, you know, a, a $2 million project, if, the, if it's the right project, could very well be a regional project with sort of regional benefits. And a $5 million project in a different setting very well might not really be a regional project. And so I think our reliance on maybe cost as sort of a proxy for sort of a definition of a regional project for the regional share maybe was was um, not the best approach. And I think what I took away from the board conversation is they want us to try to come up with a definition that doesn't solely or at all rely on sort of project cost. And so we'll, we'll be putting our heads together um, to, try to, to try to do that as challenging as it, as it might be. Um, and I think the other, the other piece that I have reflected on is the fact that the subregions being limited to submitting three regional share applications may sort of make this a bit moot anyways. Um, I think because the subregions are going to sort of, I think, work together to come up with what they think are the most competitive regional share um, uh, projects, which by definition probably means that they should, they should be able to make a really strong argument about why the project has sort of regional significance. So some more work to do on this. This input's really helpful to us though, as we as we kind of put our heads together and go back and, and kind of rethink our approach to this. Thank you, Ron. Uh, Deborah, I noticed you re-raised your hand. 
you're muting. Sorry, I clicked lower hand, so I don't know no, what. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Not. Try again. Okay. There we go. I All got right. rid of it. Sorry. All right. Thank you. Any other comments before we move on? Please raise your hand. I don't see any additional talk. All right. All right. So let's move on to the sub-regional um, formula. So the current policy is that the sub-regional funds are proportionally targeted um, by a formula of population employment in VMT. Um, these are an average, th these three are averaged and then compared to the regional total to come up with the percents for each of the subregions. And so the overall, the staff recommendation at that time was uh, we would recommend no change except to just to update the information with the current data. Uh, if you recall at your meeting last month, um, there was members who requested staff look at a uh, VMT reduction per capita and non-interstate fatal crashes reduced per capita. Um, so just maybe as a little bit more background for those who were not around um, in the process of developing the 20 to 23 um, tip policy. This, so this would have been 2017, 2018, somewhere in that range. Um, we did look at various other factors, including, you know, the ones that you see in your screen here. Um, ultimately, we sort of found that um, some of these are not reliable. Um, there was a question about the availability of the data, or in the end, most of these really were not going to make a difference in the overall percentages um, after going through all the work to figure out these as part of the entire process. Um, overall, it was just a lot easier to keep it simple um, rather than to keep adding um, different factors and make this more uh, complex. Um, so Dr. Cogstaff did look at the two requests and, and really did not find any significant percentage changes along with that. Um, it can kind of continues along with the same um, previous look at data where there was questions about the reliability and availability. Um, and especially when we were trying to look at this information via through our, our travel model and trying to determine um, on a smaller level than what the model was really intended for, you know, some of these individual travel patterns and travel situations that were, they were coming from the model and they really didn't make any sense sort of in the real world when you look at the situations between everyone commuting, um, and going going to and from um, certain locations. Um, overall, I think on a, on a staff philosophical level, we really sort of believe that, um, you know, the funding improvement projects that are, uh, you know, funded through the TIP, it really should be funded and focused to where the greatest needs are within the region. Um, you know, unfortunately, this really does translate to, to not rewarding locations you know, or forums in this instance, um, you know, additional funding for really doing better than the peers. And again, it's, it's this idea that we should try to fund those projects in those locations where they where the need and the opportunity is really is the greatest. Um, so overall, the staff recommendation would be um, to retain those target setting formulas um, and really just to update update them with the current data. Um, so this takes. Todd, had, uh, Phil Greenwald has a quick hand up for a question here, perhaps yes. before we move in to the to the to the mini meter. Go ahead, Todd, Phil. Oh, thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, Todd, thank you for this uh, information. We really appreciate it, and I know that my colleague from Boulder County, Alex Hydewright, mentioned this last meeting, and I just wanted to kind of follow up and say um, or ask the question, I guess, from Dr. Cogstaff. What would be the harm of just removing VMT as part of that calculation? We heard a lot last time about, you know, are we rewarding vehicle miles traveled? You know, the more vehicle miles traveled you have, the more money you get. And is that where we want to go? Um, the other argument was with crash reduction per VMT. Um, you know, the idea that a lot of interstates run through some of these counties and, and is it fair to uh, you know, have the crashes on these interstates apply to some of the, those crash reduction rates. So I, I guess, sorry, the question really is just, 
what's the harm of just removing VMT and just going with population and employment as being the factors? Um, from a purely looking at the table perspective, I have not done that. So I certainly would have to go back and look at that. Um, I, maybe there's some other Dr. Cog staff on the call who can get into a little bit more depth about the, the crash data and, and how that really would affect things, especially as it pertains to uh, VMT in looking at the model. I guess I'm just I'm just asking if we could if there's any any appetite I guess from the TAC to just remove VMT because it's something that especially when we get into the next couple of topics here where we talk about tip applications and how Dr. Cog's staff appear to want to uh, score that with all the different factors from the RTP um, you know basically all those factors except for freight are about uh, reducing traffic I think and VMT. So again, are we gonna, my only question and my only real request is to maybe have a little bit further discussion. Maybe this isn't the place for it, but about whether VMT is a good measure for allocating dollars uh, for tip dollars. Thank you, Phil. Um, Ron, uh, you had a comment? Yeah, I think Phil, I appreciate the, appreciate the question. And I, I don't know what the, what the outcome or the result of that would be. I, I think from, from my perspective and, and our staff group hasn't, hasn't talked about your particular question about taking BMT out of the equation. So I can't, can't speak for all of us. And certainly some of my colleagues might have a different perspective, but you know, I, I think there's a difference between how, how targets are set among the subregions and the emphasis on what what types of projects get selected and funded ultimately out of the tip and I, I i wouldn't i wouldn't want to conflate those things right this is this is only about just setting the target amounts among the various subregions and and i wasn't i wasn't at dr cock at the time when when um kind of the 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 subregional split formula was was discussed and debated but i understand that there were lots of different variations that were explored and it and I, I guess I'm I'm I don't see any compelling argument to open that up again and go back and change that formula. I think your real question is when it comes time to sort of focus on what our priorities are from the RTP and and make investment decisions in the context of this of the tip, that's where we can have the impact on sort of, the, the, the investments that happen uh, with, with these limited dollars. I think that is correct. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ryan and Phil. I do not see any other hands raised. So Todd, if you wanna move on. Okay. Um, so the question here is on the sub-regional funding split, um, one for VMT population employment, um, which again is the recommendation. And then one for adding VMT reduction per capita and then add reduction of non-interstate fatal crashes per capita. Uh, there is an other if one of these three doesn't suit your needs. And I believe the next screen that we have coming up after this would be to explain what the other would be. All right, another 10, 15 seconds here. All right, so I'll move on to the next screen, which um, what we'll ask is yeah, for those who put in other as their vote, uh, if you could explain that. Or you can do this on the screen, or if you if you want to do that vocally, you can do that too.
Right, give this another 10 or 15 seconds unless somebody stops me. All right, um, so thank you for the comments. Um, we will certainly take everything into consideration. Um, we will go back and look at what uh, VMT might do if we remove that from the equation. Um, and then we will also take a look at transit and truck VMT um, and, and see what those look like within the data that we have um, and see if having those under considerations um, could be useful or not. So all right, so I'm going to move on to the next slide then. All right, so part four, um, we're talking about tip set asides. Um, and just for reference, um, what you see on the screen here is the five set asides in the 20 the 23 tip. So um, we're still under this process, obviously, the CMPI you just heard from Brad um, a couple of items ago. So um, breakdown of, of the CMPI was funded at $4.8 million. And then you can see the two individual um, sort of subtopics underneath that. And of course, you can go down for the remaining four um, after that. So just wanted to run through some of the recommendations that staff has. Um, first of all, on the CMPI, um, the recommendation actually is to remove that set aside as it currently exists um, today. Um, we would refine and expand the studies, studies portion of that set aside and move this to a new set aside um, called Regional Planning and Technical Assistance, which we'll explain here in a little bit. Um, for the small infrastructure side of the, of the CMPI, um, those would be removed. However, um, those would still be eligible under um, the subregional share call for projects that you have. Um, for the TDM set aside, um, the proposal is to increase it overall by two million dollars um, due to growth in the region. Um, you know, and this includes growth in population, economy, um, employers in the region, and also commuters. Um, getting into a little bit more detail, um, the way to go program would increase by uh, 200,000 per year. Um, for the TDM partnerships, um, we would add one new TMA, which is the West Corridor TMA, um, increase each one of those by $20,000 per year. Um, then, of course, the final piece of that set aside is the TDM small infrastructure. Um, and that would increase by $200,000 over the current amount. For the Regional Transportation Operations and Technology, uh, staff is proposing no changes to this set aside. Um, this would keep it and remain at $20 million over the four years. For air quality improvement set aside, um, again, this funding would go directly to the RAC. Um, this would increase, uh, should say the proposed increase um, would uh, go to $7.92 million, um, which is 10% over the current set aside program. Um, includes funding that would go towards um, ozone outreach, localized community based marketing, uh, focused outreach, and air quality improvement programs, and of course, modeling. Um, for HST, Human Service Transportation, um, this currently is funded at $4 million, and the proposal will be to double this to $8 million, uh, simply due to the increasing need um, and demand that's out there. Uh, and finally, a new set aside that staff is proposing, uh, Regional Planning and Technical Assistance. Um, this is composed of three parts, uh, the first being corridor planning. Um, this would be funded at $500,000 a year. Um, essentially, this is continued work um, that Dr. Cox staff currently has in the 22 to 23 Unified Planning Work Program. 
um, that we are funding with our planning funds. Um, and we anticipate that we'd be able to fund one or two corridor studies per year. Uh, the second portion of this is regional planning studies. And again, that's taken from the CMPI. Um, this is something that would be refined and expanded um, and would continue to support land use and transportation connections. Um, this would be funded at $1.25 million per year. And but we believe we can fund approximately two to four studies per year um, from that amount. Um, the third is innovative mobility. Um, this is a, a plan and to pilot innovative mobility projects that support not only the regional transportation plan, but mobility choice blueprint and the outcomes that are accounted from both of these documents. Um, this will support both local and regional projects um, that utilize the transportation technology and innovation. Um, and this would be funded at $1.25 million per year. So altogether, um, the current set asides equate to just under $50 million. Uh, the proposal that you see on your screen here, in which Dr. Cogstaff is putting forward, uh, would be just over $63 million. Um, so this equates to approximate 28% increase. Um, the TDM services at the top of your screen, and again, would stay um, relative the same, um, except for the cost increases. Um, the regional transportation operations technology would stay exactly the same as it currently currently does. Um, for the air quality improvement set aside, um, I explained each of the categories earlier, but there's the dollar amounts that equate to each one of those um, sort of subsets. For the human service transportation, as explained, $8 million, um, you know, really going to improve the service and mobility options for the vulnerable population. Um, and then, of course, the regional planning and technical assistance, the new set aside that is proposed um, with the dollar amounts going to each one of those subset programs. So now we move into the question that we will ask tech members. Um, do you agree or disagree uh, with the staff recommendation? And then we can break it out and talk in a little bit more detail if, if necessary. All right, let's give it another 15 seconds. Todd, looking at the split, it looks like we probably should have some discussion on this. <laughs> I would agree. All right, so I will, I think I have on the next screen where you can ask questions, but I don't remember. I do, there we go. Um, so again, we can uh, enter your comment or questions on the screen, or we certainly can take them verbally if you have any. Just, just raise your hand and we'll call on you. Jean, uh, go ahead. Sure, hi, Todd, thanks so much for that presentation and for the thoughtful consideration of um, these updates. My question slash comment relates to removing the small, the proposal to remove the small infrastructure grants from the CMPI program that would be rebranded um, for plans and studies. Um, it seems that we should have a place for these types of small infrastructure projects that probably um, aren't of a large enough scale or impact um, to make their way onto even a sub-regional tip list but are really important in terms of moving forward our vision zero goals for the region. And so whether it be keeping those small infrastructure grants in the CMPI or creating a set aside specific to vision zero, it seems like those really small scale but hugely impactful, um, particularly safety projects are important to, to keep in the set asides in some form or fashion. Thanks. 
Thank you, Jean. Um, Deborah Basket. Hello, I guess I'm, I, I guess I'm confused. Um, Todd, can you go back to the part four tip set aside slide? Okay. The, the, so rec the staff recommendation? That, yes, please. Yes, okay. A quick overview again, what you're proposing here it is not increasing funding on the right-hand side. What are we looking at here? The only no increase is to the regional transportation operations and technology. Okay. That would remain at $20 million. Okay, because partly Jean, uh, the question Jean Shreve just asked, we just, we talked about uh, half an hour ago, uh, I commented the importance of those small infrastructure projects. So are, are you increasing it? No, the for, for the, okay. no, for, for the CMPI, it essentially would go away. The planning studies would be uh, transferred to the regional planning and technical assistance set aside, um, the, the one at the bottom. Um, and then the proposal would be to remove the small infrastructure side um, portion of that set aside. Um, however, that again, that would still be eligible within uh, the, the tip calls that we have. Thanks for clarifying that. So my, my reaction in looking at this is it's really important for specific projects. And I would be interested in hearing a presentation from um, Rack and about, I wouldn't bring every, every uh, TMO in, but um, we see the projects, but I kind of would like to get a better sense for what's been accomplished. Sorry if I'm not articulating exactly, but I'd like to know more before I weigh in on a recommendation on how to change the funding pots. Deborah, this is Ron. Can I just clarify your question sure. is on the on the TDM services and the air quality? Well, I actually programs. It's all it's all of the programs that I'm I'm curious about. Okay. Um, to see what we've accomplished, and maybe maybe we don't need presentations, but um, staff could either speak to it today or come back at a next meeting and uh, explain what was working or what wasn't working. I heard um, Todd say um, the way to go program, the region has grown larger or at least more people and we have de more demands there. So I think we could probably say that for every topic, but um, I'm, uh, I, I just feel like I have enough information to weigh in right now. Sure, no, I appreciate that. That's, that's helpful feedback. I think on the, on the TDM, um, maybe I'll, I'll take a moment. I'll grab the floor without permission from, from the chair. Sorry, I can't. Um, Go right ahead, Ron. <laughs> and, and use that question, Deborah, to kind of to speak to a, a few of these things. Um, so I will say that the on the TDM, on the TDM services side, um, as Todd said, um, there has been another TMA um, approved, so there's there's just an inherent growth in funding need to support the additional TMA. Um, I think when you talk to our Way to Grow uh, program staff, they they very much believe in the quality of the work and the and the partnership with those TMAs, and and the TMAs are doing more and more work. And I think we're happy to get some some additional information from Way to Get from the Way to Go program, but I think you know we've we've been hearing more and more um, around the region and, and even the state about the importance of TDM work in, in, the, in the suite of efforts that we can uh, use to help reduce uh, travel and reduce greenhouse gas emissions and address our air quality problems as, as really working in partnership with large employers and others um, to, to offer options and opportunities and counsel them and be partners with them. It, this probably would have been more important if the ETRP rule uh, that was proposed uh, from CDPHE would have would have moved forward. Um, but in the absence of that, I, one might argue that this even becomes more important because this is our opportunity to sort of reach out to employers to assist them. And we've heard some from, from business organizations around the region that they are still interested in in, in pursuing these efforts and making sure that we have adequate resources to support that is important. 
Um, on the air quality improvements um, uh, set aside, I think RAC was very thoughtful about sort of their proposal to us. Um, and, you know, the opportunity, the need to, to increase their outreach and focus their outreach and education efforts to um, improve air quality um, around the region um, and really focus some outreach and some actual improvement programs on, on some, some significant problems. And if you remember the last tip cycle, um, we had allocated a portion of the air quality improvements set aside to um, uh, a, a, an electric vehicle um, replacement and infrastructure uh, piece. And I think in light of Senate Bill 260 at the state level, which is really increase has it will increase the the amount of money for those types of projects 720 million dollars or more over the next 10 years that what we could do in that arena was was a drop in the bucket by comparison and so we asked rack to sort of rethink their program to really focus on sort of gaps um, or or niches where they could have um, an effect so that's what that represents um, and then I did want to make a note because Brad reminded me, I think when we were doing shorthand on the regional planning and technical assistance piece that that regional planning studies line at him really is st still regional planning and the local land use and transportation planning studies that you all are used to out of the out of the CMPI program that's uh, that's an error on my part not capturing that piece of it that piece would still very much be included. Um, in that. And then on the human service transportation piece, I mean, we just, we know uh, with the aging population in the region, how much of a demand there is and a need for these, for these services. And, um, you know, we went through, we went through $4 million in the, in the previous tip, kind of just like that. And kind of, we felt like this was a, this was a real, um, real need in the region to, continue to find ways to improve um, funding levels for that. So I hope that's helpful. I know that doesn't answer all your questions and we'll work on pulling together more specific information for the next TAC meeting. Ron, Actually, that was super helpful. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ron, could you also, um, like on the, you're recommending no increase in the, the RTOT program. Can you uh, bring back if they spent their money in their set aside or if they have carried money over uh, each each time yeah we can bring that back okay sure. thank you um art yeah um ron mentioned uh the human service transportation and you know i was is eight million dollars still you know inadequate to help reach vulnerable populations that we want to target. I mean, I know you have a certain amount of money, but with the new uh, regional planning and technical assistance, um, will monies there, uh, that 12 million, perhaps should more money be set aside for vulnerable populations? That's it, thanks. Thank you. Um, Todd, I'd suggest that we, if, if it will work with your schedule, that we continue the discussion next next week on on this. Yeah. And, and well, certainly we can bring this back next, next week, month. But next month. And mm -hmm. uh, I see uh, Deborah raised her hand again. Yeah, I, I have a suggestion. The next time we look at this, so I apologize. I pulled up the agenda on my other screen, and I was looking back and forth between the two previous slides and this, and then I was like, "Oh, aha! I get the answer to my question." So perhaps it would be helpful if there is an additional slide. I know it's a lot of words, but I'll let you guys figure that out. That shows the the CAD, the set aside program, the existing, and then the proposed next to it. If that makes yeah. sense. Okay. It, it certainly does. We we can we'll do that when we bring this back next month. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, go ahead and continue, Todd. All right. Okay, so here's the question, I guess, is do we need to talk about any of these other topics that were brought up during the set aside? Or should we just incorporate these into the discussions that we have next month? Let's incorporate them in and um, probably be thinking how we might address the, the small infrastructure projects if, if they're um, still, if the comments indicate 
they need to be discussed. Sounds good. We'll bring that back next month. Thank you. All right. So now we move into a discussion about the TIP application um, and, and really looking at how do we incorporate the RTP and other planning studies. Um, but I first wanted to really start out with this planning structure. And I'm sure most of you have seen this before. Uh, it's been around for, for a long time. Um, but I, I think the takeaway from today's discussion is that um, the TIP isn't necessarily just a standalone document or program off in the corner. It, it uses MetroVision, it uses the RTP, and the way that this structure is set up is the TIP implements these two documents. And again, whether it's the vision or um, the physically constrained RTP, um, the TIP really is that mechanism to fund what we have already um, discussed and what we have already put into other plans um, as this is what we'd like to happen within this four year set period. So going back and taking a look at the current application from 20 to 23, um, there was two items that were really specific to MetroVision and the Regional Transportation Plan. Um, the first being the TIP focus areas, which was in the application as, uh, as part 2B within the scoring section. And again, these three are improve mobility for the vulnerable population, um, reliability of the existing multimodal network, and improve transportation safety and security. Um, so even when the board in 2017 um, was having these discussions at their board workshop, um, they selected these three focus areas from a longer list um, that were either in MetroVision, the, at that time, the 2040 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan, or in both documents. So um, MetroVision has always been there. Um, it might not, and I'll be the first to say, it might not have been very plain and out there in the open, but we started with this process of making it more apparent within this last tip cycle. Um, the other item within the previous application that was specific to MetroVision um, was really um, the, the following scoring section, uh, part 2C, for the MetroVision transportation focused objectives, uh, where you were answering questions based on these uh, eight objectives that you see on the screen here. Um, so now that we sort of understand what the current application looks like, um, I wanted to just take a couple minutes and sort of look at what MetroVision and the regional transportation really are and how that can help us relate to where we think we probably need the direction that we need to go. Um, so just a little bit of background on MetroVision. Um, it's the region's plan for the continued su success that we would like to have um, for the metro area. You know, this is a plan that's very aspirational. It is not looking within the next five, 10 years. It is looking longer range. And it really, again, looks at the region holistically. So MetroVision is set up with themes. Um, these include place, mobility, environment, livability, and vitality. And each one of these themes have sort of aspirational outcomes and then also puts objectives with those outcomes um, so that we can start the process of being able to meet those. For the 2050 RTP, um, again, very similar, but this is for the region's multimodal transportation system. Um, you know, it contains and talks about not only what we would like as a vision for the area, but it spec you know, specifies what we can really afford. Um, so the RTP identifies priorities uh, and it guides us um, towards future investments. Um, these, these priorities identify specific projects and programs to address each of these priorities that are, that are identified. So in developing these RTP priorities, um, staff used sub-regional forums, they used interagency coordination, and of course, looking at the financial plan and what we could really afford but not only looked at what the, the plans and programs that Dr. Cog has, but worked with our partners at RTD, worked with our partners at CDOT and also the USDOT, so 
uh, federal transit and federal highway in trying to put together what are the region's plans um, and where's the, what's the path that we're, that's going forward to develop the, re, the visions and needs of these priorities. So from those priorities, um, staff was able to come up and develop these emphasis areas. Um, so multimodal mobility, freight, active transportation, regional transit, air quality, and of course, safety. So now that we have an understanding of sort of where the RTP and MetroVision are, well, how do we take that next step and to integrate that into the actual TIP um, application? And we're sort of looking at the RTP priorities. So the staff recommendation um, is on a high level is to take the current TIP focus areas that we have and transform these into the regional priorities. Um, these regional priorities um, would essentially become application scoring criteria. Um, and as we had you know, noted earlier, these link back to the other documents, not only from MetroVision, but also the RTP, um, other rules and measures such as the state greenhouse gas emissions rule and the federal performance measures that we have. Um, another thing to keep in mind is the RTP is not necessarily just a standing document. We had used these other plans within the region to develop the RTP. So it also incorporates by nature, just looking at the regional vision zero, the active transportation plan, um, the multimodal freight plan and the coordinated transit plan among many others. So looking at these six priorities in a little bit more detail. Um, so for safety, um, a theme of increasing the safety for all users of the transportation system. So it not only draws from the existing RTP priorities, but also uh, is drawn from Vision Zero and of course the federal performance measures. Um, active transportation, where the concept here is to expand and enhance active transportation uh, travel options. So again, RTP priorities is where it's drawn from, um, including the active transportation plan and MetroVision objectives. Um, for air quality, with an overall goal of improving air quality and reduce greenhouse gas emissions, um, drawn heavily from the RTP priorities and the federal performance measures, in addition to the MetroVision objectives. Um, so very similar concept here with the three remaining for the multimodal mobility, freight, in regional transit. Um, so the concept is that we're looking at the RTP, we're looking at the federal performance measures, we're looking at the freight plan, we're looking at MetroVision um, objectives, we're looking at the regional bus rapid transit feasibility study. We're bringing, trying to bring everything that has been done and you know, it's being done within the region and trying to incorporate that into the TIP criteria that we would like to develop. So now I guess we'd like to get your thoughts on this. Um, of course, you know, they have the six that we have here on the screen. Um, so I think we'd like to go through two exercises with you. One is to get your thoughts. Uh, and then for the second is a, a weighting exercise uh, to determine the relative weighting of these six regional priorities. So first the question is, um, do you agree or disagree with removing the tip focus areas and replacing them with regional priorities from the 2050 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. So in, in during this discussion, if there's uh, any other Dr. Cog staff um, that would like to add a comment or two, um, I'm specifically noting that I am not the MetroVision or the regional transportation subject matter expert. Um, so certainly if I got something wrong or if there's a different, additional information that um, they would like to convey, I'd be happy to let them have the floor to do that. Yeah, thanks, Todd. This is Jacob. I just wanna say, I think you actually did a good job when it came to the RTP. Um, and I hope the six priorities that Todd has been covering you know, resonate with you. It's been a few months since we adopted the RTP, but hopefully we, over a two-year planning process, drilled them into your head and they resonate with you that, you know, whether it was the plans that we looked at, 
um, you know, whether it was the uh, public feedback, stakeholder feedback, local governments, our committees, our board, it was really those six things that became the organizing principle of the 2050 RTP. And we referred to them as the project and program investment priorities to meet, you know, kind of those six emphasis areas in the RTP. Um, and that's our suggestion. If that's the organizing sort of framework and priorities of the RTP, doesn't that make sense to carry it forward into the new tip? Thank you, Jacob. So we'll give this another 15, 20 seconds here. All right, so let's move on to the next exercise. Actually, I'm sorry, we have another slide here. If you had any comments, suggestions, or thoughts, um, I guess feel free to um, type them on the screen or Mr. Chair, we can certainly take questions if that happens to be slightly easier. I do not see any hands raised for comments, suggestions, or thoughts, so. Okay. It's one of, the, one of the few times I saw everyone agree with your slide so far today, Todd. <laughs> All right. We'll, we'll take that as a compliment, I guess. I mean, it's, it is what it is. All yep. right. So let's move on. Um, and the next exercise that we have, and I'm hoping this conveys and works out for you from everyone's perspective. Um, but the way this exercise is set up is you should have 100 points to distribute among these six categories. And what we are asking is, how do you distribute that among the six priorities? Um, so this will, this will take a little bit of time for everyone to walk through and set their priorities before they translate it into uh, the program and we see it on the screen. So we might be leaving this open for a little while. So, and, and let me provide a little bit of background on sort of how we're thinking and organizing this setup. Um, th the concept here is that, you know, there are six priorities and not every single project that you propose is gonna be able to hit all six of these. So we're trying to determine what may be a weight that we would give each one of these priorities. Um, so for example, you know, if you had a, roadway operational project, you know, that is going to hit on safety. Um, it would hit on air quality. That has a bike ped component. It would hit on active transportation. Um, depending on the elements of the project, it could include transit elements. Um, depending on its location, it could hit on freight elements. So that that's the concept that we're going with here is that again, not yeah. every single project proposed is gonna be able to hit all six but determine uh, sort of a weighting for each of these. Yeah, Todd, there's a question in the chat asking if you could uh, define the, the difference between active transportation versus multimodal. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll take that one. So mm -hmm. in the 2050 RTP planning process, because of the work that we had done, that all of you at the local government level had done, CDOT and others had done around um, active transportation for Dr. Cog, I'll, I'll refer specifically to our regional active transportation plan, where we defined the regional network, we defined short trip opportunity zones, we defined several categories of sort of investment structure and framework in terms of, you know, bicycling, walking, rolling, you know, to have that active transportation system. We collectively, the Royal, we felt collectively that that was important to bring into uh, the 2050 RTP as one of these sort of one of the six emphasis areas. Um, so that's what that refers to. The multimodal mobility was more about, and again, there, there's overlap between these and that's intentional, but multimodal mobility was really more about, you know, it's really about how the investments get implemented, right? 
And that when we get to tip time, as we are now, when we get to project development and implementation time, that it's really about making these projects as multimodal, you know, locally appropriate context as possible. So yes, that includes active transportation. It can include some of these other categories, but it was really the notion that, you know, given these, given the limited dollars that we all have, we want the best investment, the best projects for these dollars. We want projects that can improve safety, have multiple modes, you know, improve air quality, do these things for us. And that was really, that was really the intention behind multimodal mobility. Um, hopefully that answered the question. If not, um, Jessica, please uh, uh, raise your hand. We can have further discussion. And Mr. Um, Chair, I see a couple more questions. Can I just go ahead and answer them? Yes, go I was going to go move on to them, but if you'd like to answer them, that'd be great. Yes, sir. So um, I see a question from Denver Basket. What's included in freight? Um, does it include electrification infrastructure? Freight was a broad category. It was actually originally suggested by TAC to include as one of the six priorities in the 2050 RTP. So um, I'll speak from it from the RTP perspective, but it was you all that originally proposed it. Um, but I think what you all were keying in on and what we included in the plan was the notion that um, you know, freight is multidimensional these days. It doesn't specifically include electrification infrastructure, though it certainly could, but the idea was you know, goods and services, movement through the region, particularly in COVID as we find ourselves, but even absent COVID, just the importance of how we move things through our region, um, the different types of freight, you all, we all felt that was important to include in the plan. Um, I see another question, is air quality specific to GHG emissions or ozone or both? Um, yes, <laughs> um, air quality really was sort of all of the above. Uh, some of these things were happening concurrently as we were developing the plan, but at the end of the day, air quality really is about all of those things. And there's one more on multimodal versus transit. Yeah, hopefully I covered that in my original response, but just like active transportation, you know, whether it's transit, whether it's freight, whatever it is, multimodal mobility is, route, is really about getting the most out of these projects as we implement them. They're as multimodal as possible. That's what the complete streets work is, is about, that they're as complete as possible. They help with safety, they help with air quality, they help with travel choices. Um, again, it's really being intentional about how we implement these investments in the plan. Okay. Don't see any additional comics except for Phil wanting some more points. So <laughs> on there. Uh, does this um, first of all has has uh, Jacob's answers uh, satisfied the TAC uh, members and alternates that asked the questions? If not, raise your hand or make a comment um, on there. And then the second item. Um, is uh, if there are no additional, uh, Todd, will do you have enough information to help me you move on? Yeah, I, I think we're I think we've collected enough information, uh, especially on this topic and the others, to certainly bring back what we need to uh, have some further discussions um, internally, and we'll see what we exactly bring back to you next month. So. Um, with that, I, I may ask just because there's a lot of topics that have been covered, um, any other things from Dr. Cog's staff that they would like to point out before we kind of wrap up this topic? If so, please raise your hand. I am not seeing any raise their hand, Todd, so thank you. All right, then I think we're all set unless there's any other questions. Okay, thank you. We look forward to your presentation in October. With that, I will move on to our um, last informational briefing on the federal infrastructure bill uh, summary. And I believe Ron Papstorp is going to do that. So uh, I don't think he's got it passed yet for the folks up tax. So he still doesn't have that spigot on for us to receive money. Go ahead, Ron. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, so I, I'll keep this. I'll keep this fairly brief. Um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, the Senate did pass um, an infrastructure bill. It was it was um, sort of the Fast Act reauthorization package that the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee um, had already passed out of committee, and then the Commerce Committee on the on the transit side. So that that reauthorization framework in the Senate had had really been pretty well baked. And to get to this infrastructure proposal that could garner enough votes in the Senate 
uh, to pass, um, they sort of tack on um, other infrastructure investment um, elements. And so pretty, pretty significant. Um, you know, it's not, not an insignificant investment. It does include about $550 billion in new federal spending over the next five years. Um, it includes, uh, as I said, the fast act re reauthorization. So sort of the typical programs and investments um, that you would expect in the fast act and really not significant, not really significant policy changes or, or structure, but it does, does include some new transportation programs um, uh, through, through this bill and, and through the EP, EPW um, Fast Act reauthorization, which is a part of the bill. So there is some, some new money for electric vehicle charging infrastructure. There's a new carbon reduction program. Um, there's a program uh, focused on removing barriers to opportunity caused by transportation facilities and um, new funding for broadband deployment and water infrastructure and power and grid investments and so on and so forth. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna I send out sort of at, estimates of what we think the apportionment of the highway funds will be and, an infor and some information on um, some of the grant programs. So I'll go ahead and share those tables uh, real quick just to walk through and explain the structure of the bill a little bit. Obviously, this is not, this is not a summary of the entirety of the bill um, uh, and, and all the infrastructure elements. I'm focused on the transportation piece and, and today specifically sort of the highway highway pieces. So let's get that. Um, Kent, can you, can you give me a thumbs up that you can see that on your screen? Yes, we can see it. Thank you. Okay. So I've got this table structured. I've highlighted uh, the new kind of the new programs um, in the highway side, in addition to the existing programs you're, mo you're mostly familiar with out of the FAST Act. Um, so, and they structured this bill in a unique way. So they included the Senate's um, FAST Act reauthorization bill, but then they wanted to add some additional money. And they did that through some guaranteed additional appropriations um, in the bill, which is a little unusual, um, but it is, it is guaranteed additional appropriations. So these two tables, you combine them to get to the totals. And they added those guaranteed additional appropriations in a couple of new programs. So starting with sort of the, the normal uh, reauthorization uh, pieces. You can see the, the current programs, the, the National Highway Priority Program, the Surface Transportation Block, Block Grant Program, the Highway Safety Improvement Program, Congestion Mitigation and Air Quality, um, National Highway Freight uh, Priorities, the Metro, Metropolitan Planning Program, and then they've added two, two programs um, in, in this reauthorization bill, a Carbon Reduction Program and a Protect Act, which is basically a resiliency component. These are all, these are all distributed to states um, by formula. So that's, that's, that's why I've highlighted these. These are, all out, these are all apportioned out to states each year by, by formula, and those formulas get complex and, 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 are, and can be different for different of the programs. And then the Guaranteed Appropriations piece that they added on adds a new formula bridge program and a formula electric vehicle program. Um, uh, pretty significant funding, a billion dollars a year for the EV program, five and a half billion dollars for the bridge program. Uh, for, for, and this is formula distribution. So we can do some estimates. If we I'll scroll down to the grand total then of all of those, I've, I've included the 2020 and the 2021 apportionments off to the right for those existing programs, so you can get a sense. But um, these, are, these are estimated, that last bottom table, estimated apportionments to the state of Colorado and to, to you know, basically to, to CDOT. Now, some of these, some of these uh, programs, once they're apportioned to the state, also get sub-allocated. Um, in our case, metropolitan planning, uh, a portion of that gets suballocated to the MPOs um, around the state to support our, our, um, man, our mandated uh, regional transportation planning work. SDBG program has a, a suballocation to urban areas. Um, CMAC is limited uh, mostly to being used in the air quality non-attainment areas, which in Colorado are mostly North Front Range and the Dr. Cog area. Um, and then most of these funds just stay at CDOT and CDOT, CDOT invest these funds. But um, so you can see the, the apportionments, again, estimated based on, based on what we know about the formulas and 
before any potential adjustments, because there are some minimum apportionments to states. So there are some, some strange nuances to the apportionment formulas that will ultimately get applied um, if, if, this, if this bill ends up becoming law. So consider these pretty solid estimates, but not final numbers by any stretch. Um, and, and compared to fiscal year 2020 um, apportionments for Colorado, uh, th this total is about a 25% increase um, uh, in, 20, in fiscal year 22, which would start October 1 of this year compared to 2020 um, uh, apportionments to Colorado. So a lot of that is, a lot of that is just adding new uh, apportion, of, adding new funding levels, um, increasing the funding levels for existing programs. But uh, some of it, a lot of this is also in the form of the new program. So the carbon reduction program, the protect program, uh, the formula bridge program and the um, electric vehicle programs. Those are new programs which definitely contribute to that 25% um, increase um, that we're estimating. A, a, a really important note here on the bridge, on the new bridge program. Um, we don't know, I don't know, and haven't been, we haven't been able to figure out yet what the apportionment is um, for the bridge program, because the, the way that formula works, it's distributed based on a state's share of the national cost to rehabilitate poor bridges, 75% of the distribution, and 25% based on a state's share of the national total of the cost to rehabilitate fair bridges um, across the country. And then there's a minimum, uh, a minimum amount of $45 million per year that a state could receive, um, depending on the results of that formula. And I think uh, from some conversations with some folks at CDOT, I think, you know, the state has invested in bridges. We've had the, we've had the faster bridge program now since what, 2009-ish or so. Um, and so have, have had a good history of addressing poor quality bridges around the state. So we might, Colorado might end up kind of getting dinged a little bit because we were proactive about um, taking care of bridges. Um, but again, yet to be determined on that. And that's not factored into uh, the, the increased um, amount here. So any questions on sort of are the structure of the funding programs on the highway side and sort of the apportionment and, and the programs. Happy to talk about those first before I move on to the grant programs. Any uh, questions, uh, please raise your hand. Uh, I see Brian's raised his hand, Ron. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, um, how does this bill interact or doesn't interact with the reauthorization bill? You know, because I see this as being a what, five-year program, what does it look like in terms of authorization and where are you at or what have you heard uh, associated with that uh, effort? Yeah, Washington? thanks, Brian. This, this is the vehicle for the FAST Act reauthorization. Okay. So that's, that's what this is. And, I, and, and remember, this bill has just passed the Senate. It's sitting over at the House waiting for action by the House, um, I think, um, you know, still some question about the timing for House consideration of it. It's wrapped up into sort of the larger um, three and a half trillion dollar bill, uh, kind of the budget, the budget resolution piece. So still, still some work to go here. Um, but if if this doesn't pass, um, if it doesn't pass the House in the form that it came over from the Senate. It probably doesn't pass. I think that because the Senate, I don't think the Senate's very interested in going to a conference committee to reconcile any differences between the version that passed out of the Senate and a different version that might come out of the House. Um, that's a little bit of conjecture, but I think that most people um, believe that to be to be the case. Um, so if if for some reason this falls apart and ends up not passing, then Congress is going to have to do something about reauthor reauthor reauthorizing the FAST Act because the FAST Act expires at the end of September this year. It's already had a one year extension um, uh, to the end of September this year, so it would require probably um, at least another extension, either short term or another year, while Congress figured out how they were going to um, iron out. Um, a reauthorization of the FAST Act. But right now, this is the vehicle to achieve reauthorization of the FAST Act. 
uh, a, a five-year reauthorization bill. Okay, thanks thank for you. clarifying that. Yeah, yeah thank you. So, I, oh, sorry, Kent. Yeah, I don't see any others raised unless Brian had additional comment. All right, I will uh, go on to the discretionary grant programs here. Um, most of these we've, several of these we've seen, some, some are new, but there's a significant amount of money um, here included in the bill that are uh, discretionary grant programs. So these, these funds are not apportioned out to states by formula. Uh, the US Department of Transportation uh, uh, issues a notice of funding, opportunity for these grants on whatever cycle. They solicit grant applications from eligible applicants, and then they make the, and the U.S. Department of Transportation makes decisions about what projects to fund, kind of like our competitive TIP process, right? So uh, within these programs, and each of these programs has specific eligibility, specific purposes, specific eligible applicants, and so forth. Um, I've this table, I've noted the, the major sort of highway program uh, grants, uh, grant programs that are included in the infrastructure bill, um, a, a summary of the purpose of the, of the grant program, and then some, some provision, some, some of the major provisions, but certainly would encourage anyone that's interested in, um, uh, in, the, in any of these specifics. So the nationally, nationally significant multimodal freight and highway projects, um, about a billion dollars a year, a minimum grant request of 15 million. There's a, there's a discretionary grant bridge investment program. I've got two line items in some of these because um, in, in those cases where there's two line items, the top line is the piece that's included in the body of the bill, sort of the authorized totals. And then if there's a second line, the second line below that is that additional guaranteed um, appropriation um, similar to the similar to the um, form or to the formula distribution programs um, on that first table. So the bridge investment program has um, 600 going up to 700 million dollars a year uh, between 22 and 26 in the authorization piece, and then basically doubling that amount in guaranteed appropriations each of those years. So in fiscal year 22, there would be $1.2 billion available for uh, this discretionary bridge investment program um, to improve the condition of bridges. Again, these, these are competitive grants. Um, congestion relief program, uh, 50 million. These are sort of, these are innovative um, kind of integrated multimodal solutions to congestion. Obviously, as some of these programs get pretty small, the competition is going to be higher for them. Some of that is reflected in sort of eligible applicants, so not, not, every, um, not every type of jurisdiction is necessarily eligible for all of these grant programs. In most cases, they're pretty wide open. Uh, there's an um, uh, alt fuel kind of EV, hydrogen, propane, natural gas, charging and fueling infrastructure program. Again, $300 million the first year, growing to $700 million the last year. And then uh, there's a rural surface transportation program to um, improve surface transportation infrastructure in rural parts of the state. There's a companion like the formula protect grant protect program that was in the previous table. This is a competitive grant program for people to seek additional funding. The other protect program is a formula formula distribution to states. Uh, there's a truck emissions uh, reduction program at port facilities nationally significant federal lands and tribal projects grant program. Again, the authorized grant amount is fa fairly modest at $55 million a year, but then they've added $300 million a year in guaranteed appropriations to the program uh, to make it a, a more significant package. There's a healthy streets program to, de to deal with um, uh, heat islands primarily. So um, deploying technology like cool pavements and porous pavements, expanding tree cover, um, other things to mitigate urban heat islands, um, uh, you know, $100 million a year um, in that program. There's uh, an investment in wildlife crossings, uh, a prior prioritization process pilot program around how projects are selected through TIPS. Again, fairly, fairly small amount of money there. Um, this is the reconnecting communities pilot program. So this is this is getting at, um, for instance, uh, the Central 70 project with 
removing the viaduct, putting that sec a section of Central 70 below grade, putting a cover over the top of part of it for a park and, and uh, help connecting neighborhoods. It's, it, this is an opportunity to look at further projects like this to either remove, retrofit, or mitigate existing transportation facilities that create barriers um, between communities. So historically divided communities from past investments. Um, and then I think this might be the last one, uh, national multimodal infrastructure investments at a billion dollars a year over the next five years for uh, large highway, highway or bridge projects on the national uh, freight network, national highway freight network or the national highway system. Oh, sorry. There's a, there's a local and regional project assistance piece at one and a half billion dollars a year, uh, similar capital investments, but not nationally significant, more regionally significant or locally significant uh, projects. Um, and then safe streets and roads for all program, strengthening mobility and revolutionizing transportation, demonstrating new pro demonstrating projects focused on sort of smart smart city or community technologies to improve transportation efficiency. And finally, that's it. So um, I know I went through that fairly quickly, did include all of this in the packet and happy to take any questions. Are there any questions for Ron, please raise your hand. I'm not seeing, oh, Brian, go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I think I know the answer, but um, I haven't read the 1200 plus age bill myself, but with these grants, um, do they have criteria written in the bill or will that be part of the uh, um, legislation after it comes out, interpretation? So yeah, do thanks. you know anything with that? I yeah, guess particularly you. where I was looking is like rural surface transportation and you know what's eligible for that and that's what yeah. Yep. So there, there for most of these programs, there are is specific language in the bill around the parameters of the of the grant programs. Um, as we've seen with previous discretionary grant programs, the department has some discretion to sort of apply that and create sort of the criteria for the solicitation as long as it's consistent with the law. Mac, I see you have your hands raised. Go ahead, Mac. Thank you, Kent. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Ron. Good. Uh, comprehensive, a lot out there. Uh, along the lines of Brian's question, in terms of eligibility and, uh, and the particular uh, criteria uh, that these projects, the, well, that projects will be evaluated in, in these various programs, and uh, this starting to look like uh, a much expanded infra and build uh, and and some legacies before prior to those programs on that. And then a follow-up in terms of coordination with Dr. Cog, with CDOT, certainly with RTD from an agency support uh, perspective for um, potential applications. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll take the second part of the question first, Matt, thanks. Um, <laughs> I think it, First of all, it may take it may take the department a little while to the U.S. Department of Transportation to sort of get um, notice of funding opportunities out the door with this many new new grant programs because there's a lot of new discretionary grant programs here. Um, you know, it's not like they don't have any of those programs now, but this this adds a, a fairly significant number. Um, and I think you know coordinating and and certainly thinking about potential grant applications from any of these programs in the Denver region, consistency with our regional priorities, consistent with the regional transportation plan, um, consistency with the TIP and, and just regional support, huge opportunity for us to just collaborate and coordinate and have, and have some really good conversations to kind of make sure that we, we're the most, most um, competitive as we can, because many of these Many of these programs are, are highly competitive um, across the country. I think, you know, we used to we used to say that the the infra program you, you had a better chance of getting into Harvard than you did of getting an infra grant. And I don't, I don't think the circumstance has changed much. These are highly competitive. Um, in terms of the first question, um, I'd say anyone that has a particular interest in any of these grants, I wouldn't I wouldn't suggest trying to read the whole. 2,702 pages of the bill. Um, uh, but 
If you have a particular interest in any of these grant programs, if you do open up the PDS, PDF of the bill and just do a search for the name of the grant program, it should take you to the portion of the bill that has that. And for each eligible, eligible entities, eligible projects, usually you can get a sense for the criteria, other, other uh, parameters or requirements of, of the grant program, like minimum or maximum funding request, minimum or minimum match requirements and, and, and all of that, um, whether there are restrictions on sort of locations for projects or emphasis uh, for any of the any of the grant programs. So that's a that's probably my best advice for kind of a starting place if you want to dig into any of these grant programs in more detail. Yeah. Appreciate that, Ron. Any indication on timing on those or is that still pretty uh, I don't assuming think... assuming the the you know the the lower house uh, agrees and passes and and we actually have a bill. Yeah, I, I think we don't even know what the timing is for yeah. getting getting a bill passed. Um, a lot of debate happening in the House about the sequence of events and 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 when that will or should should happen. Um, but I we hear House leadership um, committing to making sure that they get this done by the end of September, the begin so the beginning October first, the beginning of the next federal fiscal year, um, which would be nice. But then that also will put the department in a pretty significant bind to try to get the apportionment tables all done, the, apportion, the apportionments issued out to the states, and there will be a whole lot of work to kind of get through putting all these grant programs um, out the door. Um, so, boy, your guess is as good as mine about timing for that, Mac. Okay. We'll it'll, start. I, I suspect it'll take a while. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Ron. Yeah. Matt, any additional questions for Ron? Don't see any additional. Oh, uh, yeah, that's it. Um, Ron, yeah, did thank you, you have any additional? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll, we're uh, kind of working through sort of uh, some of the policy changes, uh, particularly as a result of the reauthorization bill um, as part of the part of the overall infrastructure bill. So hope to bring something to the next TAC meeting that sort of hits at some of the policy uh, changes that are important to to the region, to Dr. Cog as the as the MPO. Thank you, Ron. Thank you for your presentation. And uh, I don't know if you read all 2502 pages, but if you did, uh, kudos to you uh, on that. Uh, at this time, we'll move on to uh, other uh, items on administrative uh, member comments and other matters. And um, Carson, do you have an update on the AMP working group? Hi, Mr. Chair. We did not meet in August, so I don't have an update at this time. All right. Thank you. Um, our next meeting has been rescheduled from uh, September 27th to October 6th, uh, 2021, not October 4th, but October 6th. Are there any other comments uh, or questions come before the, or other matters to come before TAC today by the members or alternates? If so, please raise your hand. I am not seeing any additional, so we stand adjourned at 3.44. Thank you. Thanks, Ken.